the meeting to order um, just a little bit late. I apologize for that. Uh, there, Todd, thank you for being here. Uh, that's important to me as always, and Cynthia and Carly Thanks. and me. Kate's not here. Um, I'm assuming she'll be at the board meeting Monday night, so we'll do our best without her. Um, financial strategy. Dr. Maher. Well, thank you. The uh, essence of these of the work sessions is to really do a deep dive into topics that we can't ordinarily uh, get deep into at a regular board meeting. So we, we have the work session to really get deep into a topic. What we want to talk to you about today is a topic that isn't a problem, um, but it's a topic that never goes away. It's something we always talk about, and that's our budget. How do, we, how do we make sure that we're planning for today and next week, but also how are we planning for the future? Uh, in, in part of our assistance with that conversation, uh, we have a group that is called the Finance Action Network that this district has used for years, uh, certainly predates uh, my time in the Sioux Falls School District. And it's a group of folks who work in the financial industry uh, who, who come to us and give us advice. They look at our information and they give us advice. We had occasion to meet with this group um, fairly recently. And really, I'll, I'll give you the very high level of that conversation and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Veek and Mr. Morrison to talk in more detail about the, the essence of the meeting and the results of the meeting. But really what was talked about is our opt-out strategy our, as, a, as a portion of our total finance strategy. When you think about all of the revenue that we have coming in, one of the things that we've become reliant upon is opt-out. We have two opt-outs currently in place. One of those opt-outs is for seven and a half million and runs its course in 2022. That's the, that's the, be, it's out it's in the, 2021 the very, until finally. Yeah, yeah 20, so 2021 is when it's out. So when you think about the, the, the beginning of the final year, it's not that far away. So we have to begin thinking about how do we, how do we look at our opt-out strategy going forward? Two things that came up as a result of the Finance Action Network. One was that the opt-out strategy is important for us long term. Unless there's, a, unless there's some sort of change in revenue, um, in revenue in, in uh, state aid appropriations, unless there's some change there, opt-outs are a are part of our foreseeable future. And then the second um, issue is what's the appropriate way to structure those opt-outs? Currently we have two opt-outs, one for seven and a half million, one for five million. So we have a, available a total of twelve and a half million dollars. We currently use approximately nine point two million dollars. So how do we structure that? What's the strategy for opt-outs as we go forward? And the best time to talk about that is now before it becomes a critical issue. So that's the purpose of the work session today and now to put a little deti detail behind those uh, big issues, I'll turn it over to Mr. Beek. Thanks. So we're going to, uh, in this PowerPoint, kind of look through what we went with in more detail with the Finance Action Network a month or so ago. Um, for it, if anybody's watching at home, if, they're, if they go to the agenda and they, they, they click on there and they get to item two, they can, walk, they can pull up the PowerPoint at home. Um, so we'll get into this. First thing, first thing we talked about with that group is we always want to be efficient and we want to be effective. And uh, we, these are some of the indicators we looked at. We have of our neighbor of our 11 neighbors, we have the lowest tax levy in the area. Um, out of 149 districts in the state, we're 111th. Um, over the last 17 years, our our property tax has gone up about 1% a year, and that's uh, after you adjust for the change in the valuation of the home. Um, expenditures per student, we rank below our average peer group when they, we compare ourselves to, to the nation, nine peers, and uh, includes all, all, all types of costs. Um, effective, our graduation rate is 84. We're right at the state average there. Our average ACT score of 22.8 is higher than the state's, 
which is 21.9, and the national average, which is 20.8. You know, if we were a state, of the states that have over 50% of their kids take the ACT, or their graduates take the ACT, we'd be number one. So um, that's kind of interesting. And uh, a new, we're now doing the NCRC test. Uh, so platinum and gold achievement rates, uh, we're at 46%, the state average is 31, and the national average is 22%. So that's a relatively new indicator we're looking at. So we looked at uh, this in detail in at the April work session, our five-year plan. Is that pretty clear? <laughs> well, luckily, everybody's got one in front of them. Pro um, not going to talk a lot about this yet, but when we get into the next page, I'm going to leave this one up and then kind of go through it. I'll just point out, this is what Dr. Monner's talking about. The reason we had this in a box and this in a box is because that when the box starts, that would no longer be a board decision unless we do do something uh, like extend an opt-out, create a new opt-out or something. So it's just indicating that we've got to do something with an opt-out by that time or that number cannot be what we've got in the assumption right now. That's why we've boxed that. So if you guys would turn, you know, I might have to go back and forth if you can't see up there, but we're going to go to the next page and then we'll go through kind of what are the risk factors in that five-year plan and then we'll kind of show how, it, how they relate to up here. Not all of them do, but so our current opt-out capacity is 12 and a half million. We're at about 9.15 right now. Um, is that capacity adequate as we look out far into the future? Well, Doug took our original seven and a half million dollar opt-out and just that seven and a half and we're, we've got 12 and a half right now available to us. But uh, he inflated that at 2.5% a year. And what that would be in by 2028 is $11.4 million. So when you opt out, you typically don't, you, you, you can't opt out for an inflating figure. You gotta opt out a set amount and a set amount of time. So these, unless they grow some other way with a second opt out, you're, you're, you're subject to inflation with, when you do opt out. That's one thing we discussed with the group. Opt out renewal, we've been opting out for 10 years. It has a lifespan of that. That's what kind of caused this, this the meeting with the Finance Action Network in this meeting today. So you've got to, our, this opt-out is done in 2021. Enrollment growth, if our enrollment growth slows more than we project, and right now we, we have a projection of 24,068 K through 12 kids next year, and in 2014, we think that's gonna be up by um, about 450 kids. Um, if, we, if we don't achieve that, our marginal we don't make as much at the margin. Our marginal costs aren't as much as you get from the state. It's based on an average. So then your fixed costs eat up more, more, more uh, higher part of the, the pie. So that, that's a danger. Of course, if we, if we had go better than that, our budget will look better. But that, that's definitely a risk factor. It's an assumption we have to make. State funding, is it adequate to meet the needs of the district? Um, in FY, after the half cent tax increase of FY17, we had a 0.3% increase in 18, 1.7 in 19, and 1.8 in 20. So, and we talk about this all the time when we talk about the budget. Our salaries and benefits are about 85% of the general fund budget. The state aid formula is about 90% of the non-federal general fund revenues. So when you're going up, you know, the one, one and a half range, that's about what you can afford for 85% of your budget, at least over the short term, unless you somehow enhance, enhance your revenues. Um, the five-year plan has an efficiency factor in it, and we show that, uh, this efficiency factor right here. We show a 1% efficiency factor next year, which means we grow our budget and then we got to take out 1%, 1 which is about $1.8 million. I mean, to get this whole thing balanced or at 7% out here in the out years. So if we can't meet that 1% efficiency, we either have to, our revenues have to beat, our, our student numbers have to beat, something else has to happen or we got to do that efficiency. And we do, 
you know, in talking with the Finance Action Network, they realize you probably can't, you can't sustain that. But we do have out here a quarter percent finally going out in the future. When you total that whole thing up, it's, uh, what, it's uh, $5.6 million over the, so if you did nothing, if you don't do that efficiency, you got to find $5.6 million in some other way uh, over the course of this plan. The teacher delta, we have an assumption in there. Um, it's right here. We have it at 800,000, but growing a bit out into the out years because we just flipped, remember, we flipped the script on ha having an early retirement incentive to, to paying for experienced teachers. So our, re our retirements are kind of down. Eventually, those, those are going to be working themselves way back into the system. So that's why we grow that. But, but uh, if we're off on that, to the positive, then it's easier to find your efficiencies. If we're off on that to the negative, if we're not getting the delta we think, um, then it's you got to find more efficiencies to, to balance the budget. Um, inflation, we've got two and a half percent going out here in state aid. That's what we got this year. The uh, the ongoing number went up two and a half percent. We call it 1.8 because we called last year's 1. Point so, or, I'm sorry, one point, yeah, 1.7, but seven tenths of a percent of that last year was was one time. So it was either one percent and two and a half, or it was 1.7, 1.8. But two and a half percent, are we going to continue to get that? I mean, we've got that once since the new formula passed this year, and prior to that, it was 0.3 and 1.0. So that is another um, factor that really affects this plan. Um, new school opening. We had a high school and a middle school opening in the future. Now we've built that in. We put in $3 million in as a new expense, not, not part of the normal formula out in the year that they will open. But uh, when you're, you, the more schools you have with dealing with the same number of kids, the, the less efficient you are, the more fixed costs you have and the less, you know. So is that, $3 million, is that exactly the right number? Is it going to be a little higher? If it's a little bit lower, great. If it's a, it ends up being a little bit higher and we don't get the kids and all, you know, that's a fixed cost that, that we don't inflate those, we don't put those into the plan every year. When, when we increase our fixed costs, we show it as, a, as an expansion in the plan. So we got to look at that. Other revenue equalization. When they passed the, you know, they did the, the major reform and they did the half cent sales tax, they also said, but we didn't do that, we're going to equalize other revenues outside the formula. And we were actually a loser on that in, in, in the past. So we've got that built into the plan as well with a plus $2 million out into the future. You know, the legislature meets every year. And every year there's a bill introduced, at least one, to do something with the other revenue outside the that used to be outside the formula that's coming into the formula. So that's a risk factor as well um, because that's built into our plan right here is additional revenue. Um, fund balance, where's that at? Way back when, when the Finance Action Network first met, and Doug was on the original one, way back in 2006 or something like that, um, the, it was 8.5% is kind of where we were. We've kind of revised that now to write about $10 million is where we need to be at a minimum to cash flow. And, you know, we're, we actually dip below that here in this year. So you can interfund borrow, but as you're, allowing your fund balance to, to go lower, A, you've got a ca cash balance issue, but B, how do you react to, how do you react to a 0% increase from the state or a negative 8.6% from the state? So maybe you carry some additional, additional opt-out capacity for big emergencies like that that we're kind of doing right now. That's kind of the thought on that. And teacher pay, um, state funding alone, you know, if, so we had, the, we had the large increase and got the salaries up over 50000 in, in, in Sioux Falls, in, uh, and state average went up as well quite a bit. But since then, we've gotten in ongoing funds, I'll do it that way, 0.3, 1%, and then 2.5. That's an average of roughly 1.4, 1.3, What do you, I mean, I don't think we're going to be happy if our teacher salaries go up 1.4% per year. And I skipped over one, didn't I? Um, or I didn't, well, yeah, I'm going to talk about that in a second. So I meant to just 
kind of blow it off because we're going to talk about it here in a second, but I didn't say it, so I thought, oh, yeah, I missed one. But that's right. So let's just give an example of, of, of what happens when our increases are relatively small and what happens in our budget. And so we know, we know about the salaries. If we get 1.5% a year forever and we don't somehow enhance our revenues, we're going to have to, our average salary is going to have to end up going up 1.5% a year. But that's just, you know, that's just the part of it. What about the things that, uh, what about the things that cost more than that? And this is just a real simplistic look at something in our budget. When I came here, we used to budget 10% a year increases in benefits. And one year we had to do two of those. And, uh, then we negotiated and, and got it, so we're not going to go up over 14% in a year. And then in 2007, we negotiated again and we said, if we have to assume 10, 12, 14% increases in benefits out into the future, we're not going to be able to give much in raises. So we negotiated and then the district's share will only go up 5% a year. And we've been able to maintain that since that time for over 10 years. But the trend, and those of you on the insurance community, you hear this almost every time we meet, at least when the Hayes group is here. Medical trend is seven, eight, nine percent a year. So we just looked at different scenarios of five percent, six percent, seven percent, eight percent, nine percent a year growth in our just our health insurance in the general fund, and not the federal part of it, just the non-federal part of the general fund, and then what we got for the state on average in that year, uh, 1.47, I even calculated that a little high, I think it's more, it's closer to 1.3, but uh, I had a typo in one of my formulas. But so, if you just look at the five, we'll just do the top and the bottom on this. So at 5%, in 2017, that's our base year, $17.5 million is what we were spending. The next year would be 18.4. But state aid doesn't keep up with that growing at 1.47 percent. It, it brings it in at 17,785. So if you go down to the table below, the difference in that year is 619. So we got to come up with 619 thousand dollars in that year just to fund a 5 percent. And if we were to be more like with the medical trend, and we'll take the high end of the trend, you can see the rest of them, we'd be down by 1.3 million in one year. And then the next year it's 2.7, or on the low end, 1.2. And when you, you know, you get into the third year, the out year of 2020, the year we budgeted for this year, it's 1980 on the low end and 4.4 on the high end. And then you add those up, it's 3.9 million on the low end and 8.4 over the course of three years. So, you know, my first reaction to that chart is, well, we've guaranteed we're only going to go up 5%. But if our salaries can only afford to go up 1.5 and then we're going to push back more of the cost of insurance back to the employees, that just eats into that one, into that 1.5. And since we put, pay the bulk of the insurance, if, we're go, if we go up 7%, let's say, and the district goes up five and the, and the employees have to, they go up seven and then they have to eat the district's two tenths of a percent. Since we pay four times the premium they do, that's an eight, so that's a 15% increase to them if it was a 7% increase. So all you're doing is just eating right back into that, so you're, you say, okay, we're protecting the salaries a little bit by limiting ourselves to five. And we've been able to hold at five. We've never gone up more than five, but it's definitely a risk factor we always have to keep in mind. But that's kind of the whole point of that. And that's one, one example. I mean, that's just one. So what's going on? in the rest of the state. 44% um, of our districts, 65 of them in total, use an opt-out as part of their funding mix. That's up from 30% in 2004. The median levy for those that are opting out is $1.031 uh, per $1,000 of valuation. The average is 1.27, so there's some high ones. And that's not weighted, that's just each district is equal we would way pull down that average, obviously. So that, that, that's not a weighted average. Um, each community assesses its needs and funding options based on what's available to them. Some might transfer more of the capital outlay. 
and max that levy out or, or what and, uh, and uh, opt out for less or opt out for nothing. Um, each district kind of makes its own decision. We know that's the way we do it here anyway. And an example of that is our neighbor to the south, they have an opt out is for $2 million. Ours is for 9.1 plus a little bit. Um, their opt out is $422 per student and ours equals 381 right now. And then we're back to kind of like, how do we look compared to our neighbors? That's this chart we tend to show a bit. For owner occupied, we're looking at, there's 11 of us in the area. We were 11th in owner occupied, our total levy. That's what we try to balance. Like we, when we did the bond issue, we said we're gonna lower our capital outlay to offset part of that bond issue. And the two, two together are gonna equal three bucks. Um, and commercial, we rank 10th out of 11th because the opt-outs are proportional. Um, the, commercial, the, the effect on the commercial levy is higher than on an owner-occupied. That's why, that's why they're, we're 10th in them versus 11th. So, and then you say, well, geez, Sioux Falls, you've got all the valuation. Um, you know, that, that you've got over $11 billion of valuation. Yeah, but not per student. In our group, we're seventh. In the state, out of 159 districts, we're 135th. So we, we, have, we do have a lot of valuation. We also have a lot of students. So when you go on a per student basis, it looks like that. All right, any questions on any of that stuff? And if, uh, otherwise, I'll turn it over to Doug. Thanks, Doug. Yeah. On the bond, originally seven, but the bond went down to eight, so we're at now Right, we, so we're under the we were at 287, and we, we said no matter, no, no matter what, we're, we're, the first year we're going to charge 13 cents on that levy, no matter what happens with the, with the bond, with the capital outlay issue. Capital outlay, our valuation growth was higher than, it was fairly high, so we lowered that capital outlay levy, but, we, but to make that all work, we had lowered the, the special ed levy, we put them back in the, the special ed amount. Yeah, so. Not in that $3. Right, yeah, the spread isn't, right. Yeah. But, so next year we'll be at $3 between the capital LA levy and the, the bond issue. Thank the bond levy. All right, thanks, Todd. So now we'll kind of get into the specifics of the opt-out and at least, you know, uh, a couple ways to look at it and kind of what we covered with the, with the uh, fan group. So page seven, this chart is really just showing, you know, the opt-out and how, uh, you can see uh, on that chart there, you can see on the left-hand column there, uh, the seven and a half million, and when it runs off uh, after 2021, which is just around the corner, and then you can see the five million that will exist, and then ultimately uh, out in 2028, if we did nothing, we would be back to uh, no opt-out. So pretty, pretty straightforward. On page eight was the concept that um, it, Todd talked about before, it, it kind of gets lost on people, but we're not inflation adjusting right now the opt-out. So if you think about it back in, in 2012, uh, um, the seven and a half million, if you just inflate that by two and a half percent, you can see out in 2028, it's, it's equivalent to 11.4 million because we know that 85, 90% of our budget is salaries. So we know these equate to people and that people are getting increases and whatever. So if we, if we didn't, um, then we'd have to cover it somewhere else. So it's just a concept that when we looked at the strategy, we kind of had to bake that in, uh, or we're losing capacity uh, over time and not able to fulfill the, the same programs. So page nine uh, is really uh, the left-hand side of the chart is just uh, the same as the earlier one that you show. It shows the seven and a half to five million, and then your your total capacity, and then you'll see an opt-out use column there. Which again, I'm just using the inflation-adjusted number. So you can see out in 2028, that middle column goes to 11.4 million. That's simply adjust inflation-adjusting what we're spending now. It would be a, you know, a reasonable proxy of you know, out in the future, if we were to keep things the same, what we would need for, uh, for an opt-out level. And then of course, as the opt-outs roll out, we have a shortfall and then eventually in 2028, we're, we're $11.4 million short. Um, 
if you uh, if you equate and then and then from a budget perspective um, we used the five-year plan and then we simply inflated that for a reasonable inflation rate uh, and then you can see that um, you basically were in the 5.5 percent range as far as uh, the, the opt-out used as amount of the total budget that's kind of where we're at so if we look in the future that's a good marker and we'll, we'll, we'll cover that come back to that in a minute here yep so looking in that middle column the opt out you know today's date 9.1 when you go to 2022 i don't see like with the inflation would we want to add another like two million in that column as well since we know we're going to have that big jump in salary so that's kind of where it's so instead of like being at 9.31 should we be looking really at 11.31 if that's the number yep. right not as far as inflation as the opt out currently but yep. in our minds is that yeah, so when we're in a couple of slides, okay, we'll kind of, yep, we'll, we'll try to tie that together. So, so page 10 um, is, is, again, we're, we're showing on the, the left-hand side the, the opt-outs. Um, now we're sort of, um, at this point, targeting a, uh, let's just say that we wanted to have a, uh, a a $15 million opt-out in out here in 2028 and um, I'll come back to why that how that 15 point million kind of plays out into using it as the opt-out and then having some capacity but one way and in, in one way to build that fifth to that 15 million dollars over time or whatever name whatever number you want to plug in there is to start a opt-out ladder almost um, much like you have like you've seen a CD ladder and so you're not doing these herky-jerky seven million here five million here three million here and then having to react to it you're more or less building you're starting to build it a little bit over time and then so each year you can look out in the future and you say okay I, inflation is running this much I, in 10 years I, I need to target this much and you can start to you can start to target a a amount every year reacting to the circumstances at the time to try to build that so then each year only essentially a, some some small portion is rolling off right and then you're replenishing it based on what you're looking at as far as your current uh, current conditions so uh, in this scenario we would start uh, as soon as is uh, this year if you will I call it this year but really the next uh, you know, is you would start to build smaller increments and let the others fall off so that eventually you get to what we're calling 15 million here, which is a placeholder, and we'll come back to that. Um, so that's kind of the strategy that we, one of the strategies that we discuss with the, with the FAN committee. Um, and then page 11, we'll probably bring that home a little bit. Um, so page 11, um, you can see um, essentially what we're oh, okay, here. page 11 um, so on page 11 you have this what I what will say opt-out amount used at this point we're gonna just use the inflated number because we're just trying to keep up we're not trying to increase the opt-out per se for at this point for additional programs and things like this we're just trying to keep up uh, and so we're using that inflation adjusted number out here, uh, which we know comes over to this 5.5% number here uh, where, the, where the light is there. And then there's the concept of capacity. In other words, the back to all the factors that Todd was talking about was I should have some additional capacity. Just like today, I have, uh, I have 12 and a half million available, but I'm only using 9.1. I have some capacity to react to something and if we look in 2018 uh, we had about we have about 1.9 percent of uh, excess capacity of the total budget amount uh, and so um, looking at two factors one would be the usage adding in another one and a half 1.7 percent excess capacity is sort of how we came to our 15 million dollar number that we discuss with the finance action team as a target number for out in 2028 to build for, build towards. Um, 
then the next chart would simply say, as we've always said, we're, we're, we have a good track record. We only use, we've only used what we've needed. And so we're using 9.1 of the, the 12.5 that the community's entrusted with us today. Um, but we, we ran some numbers as far as what we, if we take a reasonable amount uh, change in valuation, and then we look at the uh, couple things. We look at the total amount of opt-out, if we truly used every, uh, uh, all the amount that are available, and then we have an opt-out amount actually used back to the 11 million. And then you can see what that would mean from a levy perspective per $1,000 of assessed value and then to the average homeowner, which we've been using $185,000. So the, the, probably the key thing is to look at the far right two columns here, and you can see today we're in that 57 uh, cent range. Um, and essentially as we grow uh, as a community, uh, that should drop uh, per $1,000 um, to the taxpayer. Um, so as we grew, if we grew to 15 million or we grew from let's just say 9.1 using 9.1 million to 11.4 uh, we should see that go down um, you know uh, at least on the but we but out of fairness we did show what it would mean if we were using the total 15 million because uh, not to say we would but um, if some of those risk factors uh, came in we, we uh, might have to so um, on April 23rd, uh, we met with our, our fan committee, and if you see these folks out and about, they came in and devoted you know, a significant amount of their time to studying a lot of the background. L luckily, they're, they all re-upped again, so we didn't have to cover the basics of school funding, which, as you know, is uh, a bit confusing uh, at times, and so they were um, kind of, they met about two years ago, um, and, uh, and so they were pretty well versed in our things. We updated them on the budget, went through, uh, you know, uh, sort of the risk factors and kind of the state of the state and what's been going on. So, um, and then basically what we took away from meeting with them uh, and what their conclusions were was that uh, I think it's safe to say that the, you know, the, the opt out is a critical component of the school district budget. Uh, I think if you knew, if you took seven and a half million, those are people, staff out there. If we didn't have those, we'd be doing well away with significant programs and, and, uh, and uh, significantly impacting the, the quality of the education that our kids are, are receiving. So um, that the, the current opt out allows us to deliver that current level of programming, but it also allows us some risk mitigation towards inadequate funding at the state or federal level or, or any level if that were to occur. Um, they certainly were mindful, um, as we've seen it go down, is that the fund balance is the lowest it's been in 25 years. Um, and it's, it's, as Todd said, once we get below that $10 million mark, um, I call it the Mendoza line for those baseball fans, but there's a line that you just don't wanna uh, go below, we're, we're reaching that line, uh, quite frankly, and that's not longer, uh, no longer a, a option for us, uh, really. Um, expiring the seven and a half million, if we weren't to re-up that or have a plan to replenish that, uh, that would be catastrophic to our district, uh, they felt. Um, they've acknowledged we've been fiscally conservative uh, with the amount of opt-out that we have used. So we've, we've been authorized to use 12 and a half. We've only used you know 9.1 uh, at this point. So uh, we've always tried to say every school district is different in the tools they have to bring their funding together. At the end of the day, it's that levy, that $8.6 or $8.60 that, um, you know, per homeowner that is critical, that's the bottom line. And that's what we look at when we look at all the components. Um, the 10 year target of 15 million out there, um, they thought was reasonable in order to keep the purchasing power of that seven and a half million at a 5.2% of the budget and 2% of the contingency. Although I can say there were several comments that said, is 15 million enough? And you know, we said, it's just one of those things that I think when you, um, and to the next point is that the laddering approach, 
to the opt-out has some merits, uh, but they felt that was your decision. Uh, but they certainly understood the, stood the merits of it. Uh, and I, um, I think it brings it back to uh, when we do one-time amounts here and there, here, it's, it's very hard to react to anything without having a series of you know, five million expiring here, seven and a half million expiring here, or four million here. So we're mindful of the 15 million. We're comfortable with it now. In two years, will it be the right amount? Um, maybe not, but if it's not, we can, since we're doing something every 10 years to build to that, we can react to that on a real time basis as opposed to always trying to project when things are falling off, falling on. It's just more of a regular cycle it's an extension of the budget, um, of the budgeting process, um, instead of a uh, every 10-year event um, or catching ourselves behind the eight ball. So, so that's really, um, in a nutshell, um, kind of the opt-out strategy that we looked at and and uh, brought a group together because you know, make sure that we're seeing things right. And um, I don't know, Dr. Marr or Todd, any. From the fan or group, anything that we missed as far as their comments or? No, I, think that, I think that's a great summary of where we are. So this is the same information that we shared with the Finance Action Network. And really at the end of that, it was, what do we do now? What do we do now? And our answer was, we bring it to the board. And you saw the same information that the Finance Action Network saw. Um, you've, you've seen the options for strategies that we've come up with so far um, but it, in the end it really is well what do you think yeah. would you go back to that slide seven or page seven and then so my question would be if we did do the latter approach what would be the first year we could start i mean when is the first time we can start doing that deadline of the opt-out to add that on because when so even say we started in 19 yeah. I guess that's my question, because we're losing 7.5. Right yeah, we're losing, that's a good question. Yeah. We're losing 7.5 in 2022. Right, but so, I, we'd want to start it before that. Yeah, you pointed that. So what do you think right. so, we can to do that so that we have equal out, plus if we have the programming additions of the new high schools that are still If we did, safe. yeah. Not it, actually, actually using it possibly, but being safe. So if right. we yeah. did one and a half million a, a year, and we started, and let's say, we, started next year you can't do it this year right. this calendar year right. so that'd be 2020 so you'd have four and a half million you know do it if you assume uh, one and a half million each year yeah. for 2020 2021 so and 2020 and so then you'd be at nine and a half you wouldn't you'd be a year without that cushion but that's the year we're programming but we do have that we do have we have we that have three that. million in the already planned so into the right. into the so budget so, so that's it's why making sure that we just still have that capacity as right well. but yeah. you're right Any, if any of those other factors go haywire the next three years. You can always make an adjustment in you know in your third year if something catastrophically happens to the budget, where if funding is at zero or something from the state, um, we can't sustain any you know what we do. And there's no state law about the number of opt outs you can have active at one time or there's not yet. Yeah. Okay. Just, just, sure. I'm just you know curious about those. No, you're, there isn't one. Okay, and there isn't, I mean, I like the lower amount laddering and just in that we could maybe adjust if something had occurred and so forth. So that's, I'm just curious that we're not, not looking at something else when the problem could occur. Any other questions? To me, what, it, what makes sense about it is as a homeowner, if you if you have a contingency fund for emergency repairs for uh, for home maintenance, you you do that strategically so that if the furnace goes out, if the air conditioner goes out, if you have a structural problem, if you have whatever those things are, you plan ahead for that. And I think doing this on that laddering approach it gives us the opportunity to continue to monitor but us you to continue to monitor this year after year and 
make the make the small adjustments rather than going out and saying we need to do nine million dollars because we've fallen behind on this or that it, it just to me is it, it's it, well it's doing what the finance action network has done for us is looking out ahead to make sure that we do a good job planning for what our financial needs are going to be so that we can continue to offer the same really high quality programs for 24,000 students. You, you, you are able to provide for the diversity that our school district has by doing good financial planning and not having those those huge uh, drop-offs. So it, that laddering approach makes a ton of sense to me. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, actually, the first year of the Finance, a Finance Action Network was 1996. Um, Dr. Keegan uh, had a group together. Dale Froelich was um, was the chair of it. Uh, that was when he was involved at uh, Business Aviation. Um, he's a, an attorney and a CPA, plus that business uh, ownership, and that was the first time that that group was ever brought together. So, uh, I mean, this has had a long, very successful history. So, thank you for your work on this, Doug, Todd, Dr. Maher, and all the members of the group, yes, yes. All right, then um, we are finished with that. Public input specifically on the financial strategy piece. Uh, one, two, three, okay, we're done. Um, we move on to board committee reports. Mr. Tolke. Uh, I am ashamed to say I missed the PTA meeting. Shock. The quarterly PTA meeting, and then I have not been, we haven't had a sports authority meeting, and of course my esteemed associate, Cynthia, will elaborate on the insurance committee. All right. Thank you. Uh, insurance, everything seems to be on track. Um, we had talked a long time ago about the basically two-thirds, uh, premium holiday that was we voted upon and that was received so that's all going forward and um, we'll probably have the summer off I think pretty much on that yeah. we'll talk about another meeting maybe coming up uh, calendar we just approved at our last board meeting our calendar for 20, 2021 so that's all August 27th start date that's out there for people to view uh, Sioux Falls Education Foundation Barrel House the check was about $550. Um, we've, we had a meeting yesterday and we had a financial strategy meeting last week on planning for the big event in November and the, um, I had something else I was thinking of that we did too. Oh, the teacher swap meet is coming up. So, uh, so if you wanna participate, any teachers or retired teachers or new <coughs> teachers wanna participate sure. in that, that's coming up. And affordable housing, we did not meet. Um, PATH, we met uh, briefly. Uh, we all got a, an invite to that SDSU meeting, so we briefly talked about that. Um, not a lot of other topics that are going on right now. Uh, Cynthia talked about the calendar. And then policy, uh, we just had, a, I think, three of them that had very minor changes, so you'll see those for the next meeting, just review, revise type of stuff, just sneak peek. All right, thank you. Um, budget, uh, you guys have been doing the hard work on that. Uh, and then the, uh, the budget, final budget approval will be at that first meeting in July on the 8th. Um, and uh, the chamber board, uh, uh, you know, groundbreaking, there's lots of good things going on uh, with the chamber. And STI policy, we've not met since our, since our last work session. And um, this being my last work session on the board, I want to thank all of you for what you do. It uh, makes my job easy. So thank you. 
I can't give a speech. I, yep. We'll save that for the happen. last board meeting. Yeah, well, oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, I won't get through that either. So anything else to come before the board? If not, we are adjourned. Thank you.